In the name of the God who makes a way in the wilderness, who walks with us and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We've ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under his wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it and bring your saving love to fruition in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that we may live. I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon them. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The word of the Lord. A reading from 1 Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we may not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength, but with the testing he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. The word of the Lord.
gospel according to Luke. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. They told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He, the farmer, the gardener, replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Just like last week, let me start, because it's just my mind and my heart, and it's too good of an example. It's the Ukraine again, and let's be clear about something. Let's cut to the chase. The Ukrainians, no one would suggest that the Ukrainians somehow deserve what is happening to them. Yet how often do people suggest similar things? Humans have been doing it for centuries. Jesus addresses it in the gospel lesson. People somehow equate suffering with sin. Jesus seems to understand this, or he has heard people talk in this way and anticipates the question, saying to them that those whom Herod murdered and whose blood he even defiled were certainly no worse sinners than others if they should die in this way. He then takes it a step further. Even those who fall prey to natural disaster or accidents did not deserve their fate somehow due to sin. No, he says, we are all mortal. We all die. We must all do the utmost with the time we do have and know that we will all one day, sooner than we think, stand before God. So Jesus uses this as a call for repentance now, not later. So let's cut to the chase. We often focus on whether or not others are sinners or others somehow deserve or have earned their fates. Sometimes we might even be right. Maybe someone indulged in certain behavior, or lifestyle, or whatever, and, and brought about dire circumstances. It does happen. So let's all spend time pointing out others who somehow deserve their sickness or their poverty or their suffering. Let's point out those who need to just pick themselves up, up by their bootstraps, who need to do better, who can in some way we can look down on in self-righteous pity or judgment. And yes, let's be clear about something. Sin does cause suffering. Not the sin of the person who suffers, but the sin of Herod led to the violent death of those people. War and those who use it to take over lands and power is a sin and causes the death of innocent people. Violence is a sin and causes death or pain. Prejudice and hate are sins and they cause great harm. There's economic violence, then the sin of greed that causes pain and suffering for many. But the suffering is brought about by people, not by God. God does not bring down lightning bolts on sinners. Jesus speaks against such, well, popular theology. The decisions of Pilate and Rome's agents are not synonymous with God's justice. It is important that we point out that Rome is not doing God's business. Rather, evil is at work in Rome. There are emperors who cling to power through violence. God doesn't use such violence to somehow punish people. God doesn't use natural disasters either. People do. God doesn't. As our Old Testament lesson from Isaiah reminded us, God's ways are not our ways. Rather, Jesus goes on to illustrate his point, and he tells this 
famous little parable about the fig tree that does not bear fruit. It has had three years, which is ample time. There are no excuses. And when we read this, we often want to see the owner of the tree as God the Father. In other parables like this, the owner of the vineyard is, is God. The vineyard or the fig tree are, are symbolic of the people of Israel or, or us. And God has every right, if you will, to respond with violence, we think, to cut it down, throw it into the fire. But the farmer, the one who is there getting his hands dirty, who walks among the trees, who is connected intimately to the trees and to the owner, pleads for this tree. Give me more time. Let me work on it. Let me fertilize it. I can do more for the sake of the tree. The hope is that with more time, with more work, with more care, with more nurturing, the tree will produce fruit. So what happens next year with the tree? We don't know, do we? There are three possibilities. If we are that tree, what are the possibilities? The one we like best because it allows us to humbly admit our sin, but proudly say surely we will do better, is that next year the tree bears fruit and all rejoice. It might not be a ton of fruit, but it's enough. It's enough fruit. It's not cut down. However, another possibility is that there is no fruit. There's not even a bud. And the tree is cut down and destroyed. Of course, we tend to think that that will happen to the other trees. So clearly, this parable connects with the stories that come before it, telling us all to repent now before it is too late. But maybe there is something else going on as well. Because did you notice I mentioned that there's three possibilities? The third? The third is that once again the farmer and the owner come back to the tree and it's barren. And once again the farmer successfully pleads for the tree without fruit. Again. And again. And another year. And another we must allow for that possibility because God is God. We have to allow for this third possibility because it happens in us over and over. It happens with us week in and week out. We fail to bear the fruit we can or all the fruit that God desires, and yet we are not cut down and we are not burned. Week in and week out, day in and day out, year in and year out, God continues to fertilize us with word and sacrament, with grace and mercy, with community and love, so that we might bear fruit. And when we do, if we do, if we repent, does that mean we are going to somehow avoid a catastrophic end, that a tree won't fall on us, that we will not die tragically, or that something else might not happen to us? Of course not. But when we live in repentance, when we, when we bear fruit, we strengthen our relationship with the one who stands with us in all those times of life and death, who did nothing to deserve his violent death when his blood was spilled. But surely, you say, surely not on Judgment Day. There must be a final day. There must be a final justice, we say. Let me ask you one other thing about this parable. I ask you to consider one other possibility about it. Just because. Because parables are make us, meant to prod us and make us think differently. That's the whole point of a parable. While we might see the owner as God, who has every right to cut down the barren tree, there is another way to think about it. A way that is valid. You see, really, nowhere in Luke do we find a picture of an angry, vindictive God that needs to be placated by a loving Jesus, who will get the, we will get next week the prodigal son, who will then hear about a father who longs for his son to come home, no questions asked. Consider this, maybe, maybe the owner is representative of our own sense of how we think 
the world should work. The tree doesn't bear fruit. The person doesn't perform well. People get what they deserve. Even if we don't believe that they deserve a tower to fall on them, we think that, well, three strikes and you're out. I've done all I can do. I've reached out to my brother or my sister. I've tried to reconcile in the relationship. I've tried to change my own behavior. I have waited patiently for the other person to bear fruit, to show some kindness, to be the tree I expected them to be, a good tree. After all, there must be justice. But our ways are not God's ways. Justice that begins with mercy and new life are God's ways. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus, the farmer, is pleading with us to allow more time in all of God's vineyard with all of God's children before we stop working with Christ to bring about the fruit of the vineyard in all people. What do you think? When we think of God as demanding justice, like we expect justice, it leads us to think of a God who has to kill his son on a cross so the debt can be paid. It must be paid. The scales of justice must be balanced. God beats up on Jesus and cuts him down instead of us. In contrast to this theory, maybe the cross is not about punishment, but is instead about identification, solidarity, and love. Imagine, that is, that God has to punish, that God doesn't have to punish someone. What if instead we recognize that God's answer to sin isn't punishment, but is instead love? That is, in Jesus, God loves us enough to take on our lot and our lives, identifying with us completely. In the cross, then, we just see how far God is willing to go to be with us and for us, even to the point of suffering unjustly and dying the death of a criminal, sort of like the people Herod killed or those on whom the tower fell. And in the resurrection, we see that God's solidarity and love is stronger than anything, even death. So what can we say in the face of suffering and loss? We can say that God is with us, that God understands what our suffering is like, that God has promised to redeem all things, including to redeem and change our suffering, that suffering and injustice do not have the last word in our lives, in our world, And that God will keep waiting for us and keep urging us to turn away from our self-destructive habits, to be drawn again into the embrace of a loving God. And that God pleads for us and works with us to the very end. Thanks be to God.
us now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church around the world in all its forms, for pastors, deacons, bishops, chaplains, mission developers, for church councils, committee chairs, and all lay ministry leaders, for con congregations that contemplate difficult decisions about the future of their ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the health of this planet and the well-being of all you have created, Lord. Teach us to be better stewards of the earth so that those who follow us in the years to come can also enjoy your beautiful creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those called into positions of civic responsibility, for judges, attorneys, and court administrators tasked with uncovering truth and delivering justice, for activists and community leaders who cast a vision of a more compassionate and equitable society. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who call upon you for mercy, for all who live in poverty and experience hunger, for any who feel tested beyond their strength, for those who are hospitalized or near death, and for all in need of healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the advocacy efforts of this con congregation, for those whose faith leads them to speak difficult truths and engage in difficult conversations with policymakers, for those who promote mercy over vengeance or retaliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace, peace in Russia and Ukraine, and peace in all the world. Lead us to find ways to help that show your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those whose earthly journeys have ended, we give thanks. With all the saints, we pray, we praise you for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need. For the sake of Jesus Christ, amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.